Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and begin. I'm Therese Peffer. I'm the so Associate Director for the Sustainable uh, Infrastructures Initiative here at Citrus, the C Citrus and the Bonato Institute. Um, I have a couple of announcements here. Um, first, welcome to all of you here in the room, as well as those that are at Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, the other campuses watching this. Um, everything with the lunch here is uh, compostable, and there's green bins at the back that you can put these in at the end. Uh, Wednesday, October 5th, is the Women in Technology Symposium here in the Bonito Auditorium. Registration is at women-in-technology.eventbrite.com and there's flyers in the back of the room here. At this public event, we will discuss challenges to achieving gender diversity at all organizational levels of industry, academia, and the public sector. We will also present the first Citrus Athena Awards to honor inspiring women in organizations making outstanding technical contributions and supporting the next generation of women and girls. Uh, next announcement is the Citrus Foundry is currently accepting applications for the fall 2016 cohort. Application deadline is this Sunday, September 25th at 11.59 p.m., right before midnight. Um, for more information and to apply, uh, visit citrusfoundry.org. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Susan L. Houston is a landscape and ecosystem ecologist with 30-year expertise in remote sensing data analysis. She has been a professor in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis for more than 23 years. She received a PhD in botany from the University of California, Davis in 1983 with a specialization in plant physiological ecology. She has worked with imaging, spectroscopy, and other remote sensing systems over her career, working at a variety of scales from leaf level to global. Among other studies, she has included mapping vegetation distribution and abundance, including invasive species mapping and mapping biological soil crust in semi-arid regions. She has developed methods to quantify canopy water content and wildfire risk. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Houston. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the long introduction, and uh, I'd like to say I'm happy to be here. Uh, actually, the introduction pretty much says why we're interested in invasive species and mapping them in the, in this case, in the Sacramento Delta. Um, <coughs> until a few years ago, people thought you couldn't map individual species because the spectra, the spectra of them are too similar to each other to actually do that. But it, it seems now with, with the newer generation of instruments of imaging spectrometers, it's it's quite feasible to do it. So I'll give you an example with this project. And many people in my lab have worked on it over the years, and, and so I don't always name them. So why do we care about the delta? Uh, it's the largest delta in the west coast of North and South America, and it has over 2,000 kilometers of waterways, and it's at risk of catastrophic failure from earthquakes. It has an aging levee uh, infrastructure that's at risk of failure. And yet, we're dependent on it for about two-thirds of the water supply for California. So there's a lot of reasons to care about it. And it's been identified as the most invaded estuary in the world. So the area that we're, we have data for that we've been concentrating on is more or less within this box. And that's that little circle that was on the, the introductory slide. So we're, we're inside of Sassoon you know, to the east of Sassoon Mar um, Bay, but including most of the legal delta. So before the 1970s, or up until the 1970s, the, there weren't, excuse me, there weren't very many uh, invasive aquatic weeds in the delta. Uh, there were a few riparian uh, uh, emergent things like the Thule marshes that the deltas or the valleys famous for, and then there were a few submerged species and and uh, one species of floating uh, macrophytes. Macrophytes are just meaning higher plants, not not algae. So, but by the 2000s, we have greatly increased the biodiversity with uh, quite a large number of invasive species. The two that are most in um, causing the most trouble and they're most abundant 
our Brazilian waterweed, which is a submerged species that's rooted at the bottom, and a floating species of water hyacinth. And so you see sometimes you get these reaches of the, of the delta that are completely covered with these things. And um, it's, it's a, this is a species native to Brazil and Argentina. It was introduced in the 1960s, but it didn't become invasive until uh, about the late 1980s or early 1990s. And uh, it's, it's a freshwater perennial in the delta, but um, so one of the issues with the planning for the, the tunnels is that that will increase salinity in the delta, and that one of the hopes is it'll help to control this species. Um, they're mainly light limited, but they have a low tolerance for turbidity because since they're rooted at the bottom, they need light to get all the way through the water column. And when the stands develop, they increase sedi uh, sedimentation and reduce the water velocity, so you get less turbidity um, as a result of that. So there's a positive feedback as it gets, as the water has less, is less turbid, then it, it more light gets through the water column and that facilitates more growth of these things. <coughs> uh, the problem, one of the problems is that it reduces oxygen levels below the canopy to the level that it's, it's a, a potentially, um, in, you know, a health a problem for, for fish. And uh, also, they, uh, the, the density of the stands themselves inhibits the ability of the fish to move through the, through the water column. Uh, there are a lot of other submerged species, uh, three other invasives and four native species, but none of those are very abundant. So probably somewhere 50 to 80 percent, usually the state estimates, for the total inv uh, submerged class of, of macrophytes to be the in invasive uh, Brazilian waterweed. And then on, we have uh, various other algae uh, floating things, and microcystis is a toxic blue-green. And then we have these floating ones like water hyacinth that um, uh, is not rooted. <laughs> it floats on the surface, and it, particularly in low-flow parts of the delta, it can become quite abundant like this. And uh, it's often found in multiple different stages of growth, so in order to map it, you have to be able to map for all the different phenological stages. Uh, it was also introduced in the early 1900s. It became, uh, uh, as I say, a, a problem in the late, late 1980s to early 1990s. The state mandated control for the, both water hyacinth and water, and what, uh, and Brazilian waterweed about 1998, 97, 98. Uh, so it has a very high rate of growth, which makes them, and then again, it, it does the same thing. It reduces oxygen that is difficult for fish. There's another invasive uh, water primrose that occurs in multiple growth stages that's also predominant in certain parts of the delta. So those are the main things we have to map. Uh, you, you know, they, they all have the same thing. That something happened at the end of the 1980s and the, that caused these things to become um, invasive. And I'll go into that later on. Uh, there are a couple other floating species. So, you know, the, the total range of biodiversity is pretty high, but uh, they are all pretty spectrally different. So Avaris Next Gen, Next Generation, is an imaging spectrometer that the Jet Propulsion Lab built, and they collected data for us in 2014 and 2015 with this new instrument at about two and a half meter pixels, and this just shows the area. Uh, we have to fly east to west in order to avoid sun glint on the water because you can't, obviously, the, you can't see the ref reflection uh, if you have sun glint from the from the, through the water column. Uh, it has 481 spectral bands at five nanometer sampling. Actually, there's about 435 that are unique because it's built from three different spectrometers to cover the wavelength range. And so there's about 435 that are useful. And the mosaic takes about 61 flight lines to cover the delta, and that's about a that's a, about um, two terabytes of data. 
um, of raw data, and then they have to do uh, some processing that doubles the extent. This, to these two years follow a previous time when the state had us mapping these invasives between every summer between 2004 and 2008 with a, a different instrument called HIMAP, and it had a 126 spectral band, so it's a simpler one, so not quite as, as dense of sampling intervals, but about the same spatial resolution. So we have gone back and, and reanalyzed all seven years, no, seven years at the same, with the same uh, analysis to look at the time series. So what is spectroscopy? It's, it's really using the, the spectral information across the visible, which is this 400 to, or 0.4 to 0.7 micron range, or 400 to 700 nanometers. And then uh, looking at the rest of this is in the reflected solar infrared, so it's not thermal data, it's, it's, it's reflected infrared. And this just shows you that with different types of materials, obviously you have different spectral properties, and the data quality is good enough to distinguish many or more of most of these things. So you end up with a, something like this. This is a, a data cube with a, a three-color composite on the surface, just showing a little piece of the delta and an island that's flooded. And then in the Z direction, you see the spectral information shown in different colors. So if about at 400 nanometers at this side and 2,500 nanometers at that side, and the colors go from black to blue to green to yellow, orange, and red as you get higher and higher reflectance. So you can kind of get a sense of what's going on with reflectance, like for these vegetated pixels. It's low in the visible, and then it's high in the near-infrared, and it gets darker as you go to longer wavelengths. And uh, we use, we, we uh, do several steps of data reduction to try to, uh, before we do the classifier uh, component, so we, um, just this is an illustration of if we want to separate uh, things that are either on the surface, like emergent or floating species, or, or soil that's exposed, or NPV stands sort of an acronym for non-photosynthetic vegetation, meaning dead vegetation, versus water or submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, this region right in here between, in the, um, in the shortwave infrared, uh, there's enough spectral differences to, to do a pretty good job of of just developing thresholds to separate them. And another, another example where the shape of the spectrum, in this case for, for these algal mats versus uh, submerged uh, vegetation at low density versus high density, um, you see that as you go, as you go from the visible to the near infrared, it, it, it has a slope that goes that way, whereas the the floating and the emergent ones go increase in reflectance. So there's, there's patterns like that that help you discriminate them. And then in other places, like physiologically, uh, water hyacinth, these two floating, floating species, water hyacinth ha is, has a higher water content. They're kind of succulent leaves. And so this is a water absorption band at, at about 0.97 microns. And the, it's much deeper in the water hyacinth than in the water primrose, so those physiological differences can be used. So there's a bunch of things like that that we can take advantage of, that we can measure and use to, as in the classification step to get the maps. And uh, we also do a lot of field work to support both the, mostly to support the validation, but uh, this shows for where we did field measurements in 2014 and 2015. This looks like it got squished a bit. I don't know what I did, but <laughs> they should be the same size. Anyway, we typically have ma uh, map the location of, of the uh, species or water or dead vegetation or whatever is the condition, usually at a, somewhere around 1,000 data points across the delta each year. And 
in a lot of cases, the, the submerged species, we've done some studies, and maybe if I have time, I'll, I'll show you later, but uh, for the submerged uh, Egeria, the Brazilian waterweed, about a third of it stays, re regrows the next year, so it's in the same place, and the rest of it dies. So, you know, it doesn't completely change from year to year. And this is just an example of the data we collected last, last year um, showing how many uh, data points we had for, for each of these different species or, or you know, conditions, water. And we, we break up the water into some, something about the turbidity. So we measure with a secchi disk to get some estimate of, uh, some estimate of turbidity. Uh, so the workflow goes sort of like this. Uh, there's a pre-processing step that we have to do an atmospheric calibration to go from radiance to reflectance, and we also need to do a secondary um, georegistration. The data comes uh, rotated from Jet Propulsion Lab, so we have to rotate it to the right orientation and then do a secondary correction. And then we uh, uh, look at uh, different ways to, to do a data reduction, so the amount of data isn't 435 bands for, you know, 2 billion pixels in the classifier. It's <laughs> so, and then we, right now we've been using a random forest classifier. It's a, a recursive uh, a classifier that samples the, the training and validation data set, and, and it does that repeatedly over many times, and then it gets, it uses the average class for that pixel to come up with a classification. And uh, for the last few years, that's been the, had the best accuracy. We've tried support vector machines and neural nets and many other ways of doing it, and this seems to consistently be better. And that's, I think, also true in the remote sensing literature right now. And then we use the, on the data we didn't use for training to do for validation. Uh, so then we, we now have uh, spatial distributions of mostly at the species level, but for the submerged one, it's mostly as a class uh, from 2004 to, to this year. And uh, we, if the state ever, if, if Davis ever gets the contract signed with the state, JPL's going to fly, fly the Delta again <laughs> two weeks from now. <laughs> And so we have the Space Act agreement in place, but we haven't got the money in place. But, and then uh, that's, it's a three-year grant, so we'll, they're going to extend it for three more years, the flights. <coughs> and uh, anyway, so then we, we end up with, uh, besides the classification, some other information about, about the, uh, the, uh, the stands themselves. So in terms of... Oh, let's see if I do it right. Uh, the uh, atmospheric calibration, we use a radiative transfer model to, to estimate what the atmospheric properties are and, and be able to calibrate the radiance data to, to uh, uh, top of the canopy reflectance data. And then we co-registered the images together actually back to 2004, so then we can do the time series. So. I think the, the high map data is much smaller data sets, but probably overall it's about 10 terabytes of raw data. So, and that just sort of illustrates how random forest works. It, 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 it samples, uh, subsamples a uh, part of the data, does the, does the best prediction of the, chem of the species, and then it does that a thousand times or something, and then you, you take the average. So this was our map for 2015 at this scale. You don't see very much detail except in places where, you know, where the uh, submerged aquatic weeds are very densely, you know, occupying large bodies of water. But uh, we'll, I'm going to go back and show you some of the more detailed um, maps of it. And then here's comparing uh, 2014 for the SAV in general. The, you notice some of these big lakes aren't so full. It's around the edges. It's a little red. But uh, 
this year, this year it was very different. And that's one of the things we found is how dynamic these populations are and how they change with the conditions, um, at, you know, each year. It's they're, they're very unstable. And then this shows for the two, two dominant floating species of which you can't really even hardly see at the scale. So this is about 2,500 square kilometers. So it mapped at two and a half meter ground resolution. And we end up with a, with a, a, a classification and an accuracy assessment. So based on our field data and, and our validation data, it, we usually end up with a, you know, quite a high accuracy. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go through each of these examples unless we get too bored. And uh, so they come from different parts of the delta. This, they kind of from west to east, the conditions vary. And also the size of the waterways and the, you know, how, how high the flow is. These are, this is, ranks tracks of big flooded island, big breaks of flooded island, Sherman Island. So they're, they're quite different. And this is an old slide, but I, it showed uh, something I wanted, which is illustrating like the, the white, the white and blue uh, X's are the field data from that particular time for this little um, uh, uh, area in here called Venice Cut. And the classification is it's mostly uh, submerged, these submerged um, aquatic weed class. So this is the channel. And then this is an island, and that island has been breached, so the center of it's all flooded. That's what you're looking at. And so you see a, most of it's with submerged, but then you have a little bit of water hyacinth around the edges. But when you look at it in color infrared, all you see is it looks kind of like a pink blob. So you, you cannot do this with multispectral data, uh, even if you have a high spatial resolution like this data. And uh, at this, for this particular date, we actually had information from boating and waterways where they sprayed. So these are all their spray tracks in here that they did. So we had data in June. This is a density map. So just to illustrate where the, where the, uh, the submerged aquatic weeds are most dense, then they sprayed, and then what it was like in the fall. So the, typically the spraying reduces it, but doesn't, uh, it's not a, they're not trying to eradicate it, they're trying to keep the waterways open for boating. And that's their mandate. So even though they, it costs like $11 million a year to spray it, but they, <laughs> they can't control it. So more recently, Venice Cut is this little piece right in here. This is one piece of it. Uh, you see from 2014 to 2015 that in this area, there was a lot less of the submerged aquatic weeds than in 2015. They really expanded in this period. Uh, at, and, um, but the, the other, the emergent and the, uh, the, the dry vegetation has more or less stayed this, the same in this two t area. So I'm going to go through a couple of these. Then after you've identified the class, you can go back and reanalyze it and then predict the density of how much material is there. So the color goes just from, from sort of, anyway, non, no, no, none of it present to very dense. So you see that it's kind of hugging around the edge of the island, not so much out in the middle. Whereas this year, in 2015, it really uh, grew, a lot more of it grew into the center because we had a very, you know, we had a pretty hot summer last summer, and, and so there was um, a, a, a big opportunity, I guess, for it to, to uh, expand its growth more than the previous year. So ward cut has a really different distribution. In this case, the, the 2015 data, or 2014 data, the submerged was not as, as dense, and then it grew a lot more this year. And what was lost was um, actually this blue is the pennywort. That's the uh, flo floating species uh, grew more around the edges. And then what was lost was the emergent and the dry vegetation. There was 
um, or there was more drive education in 2015 than 2014. And again here, so you see there. So what we found is that there's a typical pattern of where things are arranged from the, from the edge of the land mass out into the water. They, they, they take a particular um, pattern of uh, who grows where. And hopefully I will, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I down, it's down lower, so I'll come to that in a minute. This one is uh, Frank's tract. And uh, normally, it, it gets a lot of tidal influence. It's, it's here, this is it, it's a big flooded island, and it has a lot of tidal influence. And you get um, the submerged species growing around the edges because there's a lot of flow. But last year, they, they installed a temporary drought barrier to prevent salt intrusion farther up, upstream. So what happened was then the, the, the tide movement came around the north side and came in this area. And because this is a lot more, there was a lot less movement of water through the system, it totally filled up with the submerged species. And you just see a little bit of more open space kind of around this, this uh, main entry point or flux point into, the, into that uh, flooded island. So this year they've taken out the drought barrier. So we will find out whether that has improved the situation. Because this, uh, with the, because of the high tidal influence, it acts like a nursery to a lot of the rest of the delta spreading these things around and contributes a lot to the spread of this stuff in other places. And here you see the difference in the density between 2014 and 2015. And we do have, this is just an example, but it, since we have the data for all these years, these are all co-registered and we reanalyzed them all with the same, obviously the same analysis, so they're consistent. And you can see 20, 2005, 6, 7, 8. So this was much lower because of a change in how boating and waterways manage the, uh, their, their spraying and an agreement they had with EPA that allowed them to spray in a more effective way. And then 2014, and then last year. So really dynamic um, patterns, and that just shows what they're like for each year. Uh, yeah, anyway, big break is over, over here. It's this one, and Sherman Island. There's a bunch of people here at Davis working out on Sherman Island, at least in Dennis Baldaki and other people, I guess, in the um, ESPM department. Uh, again, showing the, the density of these things. So uh, Sherman Island, you notice this, this pattern is a little bit different from, from most of these. They're, they're, uh, they're most, most of these this year were, were um, the submerged vegetation, one, the agaria, but uh, this one's actually a different species. It's called uh, um, something or other. I'll have to think about it. Anyway, it's a different species. So you see it has this, a very different growth form and way the, the, the little patches of vegetation grow. So you can, uh, distinguish it. And then the last place I want to show is uh, 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 Liberty Island. Liberty Island was, um, the, was the breach, the levees were breached in the, I think around, I've forgotten the details, but around 1990 and it was, a, it was repaired, then it breached again and then they allowed it to stay flooded. It used to be uh, so it's a shallow lake of former agricultural uh, land use. And so a lot of the patterns relate to uh, uh, small levees that, that separated the different fields. And it's important because it's the main, it's, it's the main nursery for the delta smelt and some of the other endangered pelagic fish in the delta. And part of it <coughs> is because over this first 
I don't know, 15 years of recovery, uh, much of the vegetation has not been these invasive species, it's been the native emergent species and that's thought to have been very um, uh, important for, for developing this area as a nursery for these endangered fish. So, uh, I divided it into three, three different areas, so up here in the north it's, it's, it's not so much of a, it's, it's still mostly terrestrial with a small area than these areas where it's been growing out into these uh, former uh, flooded, any flooded fields and then the south delta where, where the wind patterns and things are, are very different and it requires a, uh, or it re results in a different pattern of, of growth. So in the north, because uh, in 14 and 15, the, a lot of the land was, was fallow or, or at least dry in the, in the fall when, when they collected this data, so all the orange is, is dry plant material and you see you have some, a lot of submerged in, this, in, the, in these uh, streams that go up to the north of it, but uh, most of the rest of it in the, this part, so the tules and the cattails and the emergent species that are, th these are all levee roads across the different fields and then the, they're growing out into the water, so these are still very shallow and, and uh, most of this was dry in, in 2014, then it's much greener this year, but those are the native species that are, uh, seem to be helping the, the uh, recovery of some of these, or maybe not recovery, but anyway, helping the nursery for these endangered fish. But uh, in the last two years with the drought, uh, a, lo a lot of the submerged vegetation is taking hold along the edges of this expansion. And then in the south part of the Liberty Island, it's, it's uh, you see there's very little growth out away from the levees. And then here in 2015, it's all, it's all uh, Egeria, uh, the Brazilian waterweed. So, so what you have is a pattern like this that uh, uh, the submerged aquatic plants grow out, they start on the edge and they, they expand out into the water till it gets to be too deep for them and they don't have enough light at the bottom so they, that's, that's the maximum distance they can grow away from the shore. And then you have uh, usually some water hyacinth or potentially a, a pennywort growing right next to the cattails and tules. They're the next, you know, the things at the wetlands right at the edge of the water. And, uh, and then as they, as they grow, the, these things expand as much as they can, but then water hyacinth starts, the mat of that on, that's floating on the surface starts growing out into the, away from the shoreline. And it keeps growing and expanding and expanding out into the water till it, till it shades out the, the submerged ones. So, you'll see the, wa the water hyacinth replacing the submerged um, uh, egarias um, in a lot of the, the patterns that you see. And then eventually this trail of floating uh, plant mass, uh, you know, you'll have waves come through or wind or something, it'll break them loose, they'll float off and eventually they, you know, they leave the system. But uh, when they do, then either the submerged can recover or you get an expansion of these other floating species. So, to summarize the, this uh, over the 20, 2004 to 2015 period, our earlier data, uh, this just shows 2004 and 2008 and 14 and 15. So, 14 wasn't so different from the, in the past, the, the submerged uh, aquatic weeds were about, you know, 3,000 uh, hectares in area, but then suddenly in 2015 it sort of pretty much doubled. But the floating ones, the water hyacinth, it was really high in 2014, but now it seems to be more or less what it was in the previous years. And then you also see that the, the three different floating species, 
Water hyacinth tends to be the dominant because it's so fast growing, but it's, uh, the amount of it, ha the distribution of those have changed a lot from, from one year to the next. So water primrose is another invasive, but pennywort is a, is a native species. So uh, you have uh, a very dynamic species. So we ask, I got a couple more minutes, we ask why is it such a successful invader? Well, it's rooted and they grow through the water column and the leaves are distributed throughout the water columns and they're large, relatively speaking, for these plants. So they are very efficient at photosynthesis. They trap sediment in the, and the, within the stand and then that increases light penetration, so that's a positive feedback. And then I said they have large leaves and dense canopies and very rapid growth rates. So we did some measurements looking at, at them. Here's just the, what the, the native ones look like that and the invasive ones look like that. They, they just make larger, denser canopies. And in general, the, uh, the non-natives have higher chlorophyll concentrations and higher carotenoid, so that's their photosynthetic apparatus compared. These are two different ways of calculating at two different types of measurements. And just to say they're, they're more or less the same. And, and anthocyanins are, are some protective pigments that are, they're not photosynthetic, but they're protective in the, in the system. We also looked at the, the delta C13 ratios. They vary with uh, whether the plants are C3 and C4. And uh, these things turn out to be facultative C4. That means they have, they can both do C3 photosynthesis, which is the kind of quote normal kind where the first product of the photosynthesis is a three carbon, three carbon uh, molecule. And, um, but by being able to, be, to, to go between these two different forms of photosynthesis, it means they can take advantage of both high light at the surface and low light at the bottom. And that contributes to their, their capacity. The other thing that, why did they start ex exploding in the late, in the, say, the early 1990s. Well, uh, the USGS has looked at um, turbidity monitoring for a long time, and in general, there are these somewhat downward trajectories for most of the stations through the delta on, on uh, uh, monitoring from between, this shows from 1975 to 2010. Uh, but what, in the analysis that was done, they generally found that there were there were kind of uh, three or three breaks in the in the pattern. One in the late night in the about 1983, after the the 82-83 El Nino, there was a lot more flushing of sediments through the system that weren't trapped behind dams. And then in 1997-98, there was a not as strong of an El Nino, but a second El Nino that uh, additionally removed some of the sediment from the system. And then since then, it's continued to decline. And what they show is that the turbidity trend after you remove the, 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 the accounting for the fl differences in the flow and, and sediment supply, that when SAV cover is low, it doesn't, it, it doesn't contribute much to the de continuing decline in turbidity in the system. But when it's at denser levels, at higher levels, it, it does uh, have a significant impact. And that, that increasing clarity of the water column contributes to the, these invasive species, but it also is believed to contribute to some of the decline in the delta smelt because, and the fintail and the other pelagic fish, because they declined at the same time the, these trends happen and the, and the increase in these submerged species. Uh, and probably because they're, well, at least it's partly due to the fact that their main predator, the, ba the bass, are, are visual predators. Anyway, so we have this kind of little cartoon to show the, that under, under uh, uh, higher turbidities you get uh, low resuspension and not so good growth of these things. But then as you get uh, less turbidity, uh, you have uh, higher growth of these things and you have more 
less uh, velocity of the flows because these things impede the flows and so you have less resuspension and so it makes a, a kind of a positive feedback loop. And I'm going to stop, I won't, but we, we did a little bit of work on looking at can we identify the different species of submerged weeds, that's been a big problem and uh, we did, we had a little area of the delta where we had all the species present and somewhat separated into different areas and we did, we were able a little bit to, uh, to classify them to different species. So there's some help or some evidence that that can be done. So with that I'm going to stop and let, well, I'm going to maybe stop and let you ask me questions. So do we have any questions about today's talk? Hi, yes. great talk. Um, can a can a drone be used to help detect these vegetations? Uh, uh, yes, in principle, but um, uh, it the small drones that you know everybody's flying for hobby craft and stuff. They they uh, they can't fly a large enough area. This is 2,500 square kilometers is big, <laughs> right? So it takes. Uh, for the Everest next gen, it, it took about four flight days to cover the delta with, with a P3 plane. So, uh, so it would be sort of hard, but you know, there are like Sierra class or you know, something larger than the usual hobby cl class you could use and that would work. But there aren't really uh, science grade instruments that small yet. There's, there, are, there, there are little miniature instruments out on the market, but the quality of the data is not very good yet. And uh, that's so, so it's two things that are, but there's no reason in the future that can't happen. And if you didn't want a, such a big area or you didn't care if it was flown all at the same time, you could certainly do it. Oh, uh, it's kind of a similar question. So let's say you have high resolution data. Um, what you had, like, you had a 360 <laughs> spectral advance, it's a yeah, lot. Yeah, 435. But yeah, but <laughs> is it possible to downscale them, like, from 2.5 meter to something a lot? Um, smaller? Yeah, Spatial smaller. Spatial resolution? Right, um, using other data. Like that, inst you know, because you're, you're, the limitation is the, is the signal to noise, right? That you only have so many photons you can capture, so you can, fly it slower, maybe that's where a drone could come in, or you could, uh, uh, if you want a smaller spatial resolution. But this instrument um, has been flown at one meter ground resolution. But, you know, the, the less photons you capture for each band, the, l the more noisy it is. And, anyway, yes? Again, with, with the high resolution data for a reasonably large area, is there anything to be learned for the agricultural land or the built environment? Uh, I haven't worked on that because we, we were really busy with the aquatic one. <laughs> but I have given the data to other people to, who have been interested in the agricultural, like how has it changed with the drought? Or uh, how much land is fallow in a given year and what the different crops are. So yes, there are definitely people looking at that. Uh, we, we did have, well, the state of, the, the Department of Water Resources acquired uh, LIDAR data for the entire delta at one, well, rasterized at one meter in the 10 years ago. And we did analyze all of that data and we did look at the levees, for instance, and and then they got mad at us for publishing, a, said the, <laughs> the land around the pocket area in Sacramento <laughs> doesn't meet any of the Corps of Engineers requirements for a <laughs> 100-year flood. So, so uh, anyway, so they didn't give me the second set of data they collected later. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Um, okay. You had mentioned the uh, different growth patterns, and, uh, and I was wondering if there's ways to um, uh, quantify, quantify the spatial patterns and, and textural characteristics? Uh, definitely, <laughs> some of it could be done. The, the, 
the, the three different floating species are, have fairly different canopy structures and so they do have different texture. And then of course they, they ab abut the tules and the cattails that have this vertical structure. So one possibility is either looking at the texture information in the spectral, you know, pixel to pixel information or to combine it with the LIDAR data that would give you more information about the texture. Yeah. So does the water level in the delta will affecting the readings from the uh, <laughs> spectrometer? Yes. <laughs> uh, we try to, we, we go to the tide tables and we try to organize it to do the best we can when it's low tide, but when it's low tide at the west end of the delta, it's not low tide at the east end, right? And we have to fly these things east to west because we're avoiding sun glint because then all you do is get, you know, like a mirror, right? You don't get in, you don't know what's in the water. So you uh, come with various compromises. We did some years ago do a study to look at the problem and we used uh, these, these rakes to, you know, pull up the weeds when they weren't at the surface to see what was underneath and we, we did an estimate of the density by species. And if, if there's enough light to get to the bottom, you can see them. That's what we figured out you know, from this. So it actually isn't such a big problem, but, you know, we try not to go on the highest high tide, right? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's easier problem if it's lower tide because then more of the canopies, exp the submerged ones are exposed at the surface. Okay. Well, if we have no, no more questions, please join me in thanking Dr. Great. Thank you.